Hey everyone, our next guest we interviewed for the Meyer Clinics podcast, which is the only Christian based podcast on our network. And I thought, should I air this on my show as well, since we have different audiences and I'm just going to anyway, I'm trying to get past my own bias when it comes to talking about things like Christianity. It can be rough for me. And I think it's interesting that I can talk to someone about their faith in any other religion. Well, not any other, but you know what I'm saying. In many other religions or someone that, you know, has no faith in any religion whatsoever. And I don't have emotional stuff come up around that. But I do when it's Christianity. And that's my own stuff. And I'm, uh, I'm certainly, you know, taking a look at that. And I thought, hey, my listeners are my listeners. Some of you are devout Christians. Some of you aren't. You're going to take this how you take it. To me, it's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful person. And she believes what she believes. And part of her belief system is what has brought her through some pretty horrific things like early childhood sexual abuse. So I want to just share it as is, and I guess I felt like I needed a disclaimer, but those of you who've been listening to me for a long time will understand why. (laughs) She is Brenda Crouch. She's a TV host, speaker, author, and singer-songwriter who shares a dynamic message of healing and restoration along with her husband, American Christian broadcaster and film producer, Paul Crouch Jr. An iron fist in a velvet glove, Brenda's best-selling book, Fight Forward, Reclaim the Real You, frees people to experience their God-given identity and ultimate purpose. She joins me with Dr. Lisa Day, and we have a lovely, lovely conversation. I'm not the house of cards that falls down easily. I'm strong enough to handle what you throw at me. Welcome to Mental Health News Radio. I'm your host, Kristen Sunanta Walker. Just what are we going to discuss? The intimacy that is mental health. Let's continue to make it as comfortable as discussing brain health or heart health. This show has been on the air for several years and we have amazing co-hosts. And then we created a network of podcasters on mentalhealthnewsradionetwork.com, a place where every possible facet of mental well-being can be talked about openly. My show, after several hundred interviews, the format is this. Intimate, deep, funny, touching, sometimes uncomfortable, but always vulnerable conversations with interesting people. The goal is to have you, our listening family, many of you who have become my good friends, feel as though you are listening in on private conversations. Thank you for tuning in and becoming part of this amazing journey with me and now with our network of podcasters. Just knowing this podcast might be helping any of you realize you are not alone on this journey called being a human being makes doing this podcast worth every second. Hi, everyone. We are back and we have a wonderful guest today. And of course, I'm here with Dr. Lisa Day. Hi, Lisa. Hello. Hi there. (laughs) Our guest today is Brenda Crouch, as you just heard. And um, Brenda, thanks so much for coming on the Meyer Clinics podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Kristen, for having me. It's, It's an honor. Absolutely. So Dr. Lisa Day, I would love for you to share what I was listening to you say after, um, reading Brenda's book and me thinking, Oh, wait, let's record that. That was really good. So will you go ahead and <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to. And, and so what I was saying is that Kristen, you and I have been so very focused on the big project that we did in Michigan and it was such a beautiful success and got, you know, I knew that we were going to be doing this podcast, but Brenda, I had not read your book. And, and again, before I do any podcasts, I want to know who I'm speaking to obviously and, and the content mm-hmm. of their work. And, and so I sat down on Sunday thinking I was going to speed read this book just to kind of glance over and to know what the gist of it was and, and went from sitting on my bedroom floor to speed read read through it to climbing on my bed. I had it on the the downloaded book. Uh, And I would say that I was blown away. I had goosebumps Mm -hmm. from head to toe. I read a lot of stuff. I really do for as being a therapist for 25 years and and working from our clinics that entire time. And um, with goosebumps, I would share with you that as I read the book, uh, there was, it was more than clear to me that that book was put in my lap, not only to be able to have a podcast with you, but it spoke to me personally and and profoundly to so many people who I work with mm. who struggle in abusive dynamics and wonder how, you know, if this God is a God who takes care of us and protects us, 
how could I possibly yeah. find you myself in this situation and how that's <clears throat> internalized. So I want to thank you, Kristen, for putting Brenda and I together <laughs> to do this podcast. And Brenda, I just want to thank you so much for your work because it absolutely profoundly touched me personally and professionally. I'll be able to share it with so many people. Oh, that means the world to me. And thank you so much for sharing that and for taking the time. It is a definitely a deeper well, and it, it's, uh, uh, not, it's a journey, and that's what I've described it as. So thank you so much. It means a lot. Absolutely. Tell us how you navigate, because <laughs> I am struggling with this right now, <clears throat> and Lisa knows this too. How do you navigate the entertainment world, which can be really challenging, Especially when you're someone that has faith, um, how how are you navigating that and and staying unfettered or um, non what's what's the resentful sure. or angry? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do, and and I think that to answer that um, very honestly, you know, there was a time in my life when I was very um interjected and wrapped up in the entertainment world and field as an identity so to speak and i talk about that in depth in my book but because of my journey i have come to a place where i understand that that's not who i am and so there's nothing really that moves me or shakes me or the sense of truth that's within me anymore i'm not impressed by images um, because I've seen behind them, it's, it's like, you know, the Wizard of Oz, when you finally, the, the curtain gets pulled yeah. back and you really see the truth that's behind the curtain. So, you know, while I certainly don't um, condemn anyone for being involved in the entertainment industry, I think we need to be a light and we need to bring good stories, you know, to film. And that's what my mm -hmm. husband and I do. That's one aspect of what we do. So we, we do have our hands uh, dipped in Hollywood. But we also work in Christian media. And so, you know, believe it or not, there are um, challenges that, that even come with that behind the scenes. And, you know, because people are looking for platform for their value. Yes. And I think this is a real serious issue today. And uh, because I understand the journey of coming unraveled from that, I now can be the, the compassionate set of eyes and ears that uh, I, I almost feel like God has me positioned as like the stealth bomber that kind of goes in and and uh, can absolutely provide an atmosphere to remove the mask behind the scenes for people to, um, you know, have a safe place to become vulnerable enough to discover who they really are. Because I don't think that we can really serve our purpose well until we really have that foundation. So there's um, I guess to answer your question in a nutshell, I had to explain that to say that I understand that I, I'm I'm not going to serve my purpose well if I'm caught up in the uh, enamorment of um, celebrity. And so I think that I see people as people and I respect the accolades and the accomplishments. I certainly do, but I I see people as people and I have an ability to see beyond the mask. Well, that's good. I mean, how do you handle or have you handled, because it's probably gotten more expansive or more with more understanding, the longer you've been dipping into that entertainment world and you're, you know, you are steeped in it in many ways. How have you handled the challenge of people seeing you and they don't really see you. They see you as what uh -huh. they think that you're going to do uh -huh. for them because you've got this platform. Yeah, man, that's such a good question. And thank you for asking it because <laughs> I'm dealing with it too. You know, so they, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> you know they say, uh, that it's lonely at the top. And I certainly am not projecting that I'm at the top by any stretch of uh, the imagination, but, um, you know, but God has brought me from, you know, um, such an unusual background to a place of elevation where I have a platform and I'm thankful for that. But, you know, when you do have um, the ability to or, or when you're connected to this platform people do come with agendas yeah. and I have had to learn um, because I'm such a trusting soul um, <laughs> and you wouldn't think that I would be but 
Uh, I think that's kind of because I'm a compassionate person and I am looking for authenticity in people. I desire to have real authentic relationships. And those are few and far between. I think the ones who can really be in your inner circle are those who just are not coming with that agenda. And I think I've had um, over the last few years, it's been a bit of a challenge to adjust to that. But I, um, I have felt like it in the last, within the last two years, at least that I've something clicked inside of me. And, you know, it's like that, that next layer, uh, uh, you know, of just the the fight of the butterfly, the fight forward of mm-hmm. understanding, you know what, I, I can do this. And, and it's about what I'm giving to them. And so I guess I'm less in need of that okay. um, as I once was. That makes total sense. Lisa, I'm so sorry, because I heard you Getting ready. Oh to no, fire you just mentioned. you just you know me, Chris, and I'm always on the edge of my seat going, Oh, oh, pick me, pick me. Pick me. <laughs> oh god. Go for it. But that was no, such no, a good no. question. Man, well, they're right fan- the top, fantastic questions. And and I think that, you know, what I think I would love to um for you to share with our listeners, Brenda, is that you know, where you are now is absolutely a a reflection of the hard work that you've done. And, and that when folks have grown up um, a victim of, of child abuse or have experienced ongoing abuse, no matter what that dynamic, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, sexual, physical, all of those good things that can really, you know, destroy us, you know, that so many people um, become very skilled in um, internalizing that, you know, stuffing those emotions, um, hide, hiding that hurt. And then we, you know, these folks, present what they believe other people want to see as collected and good and together. And, you know, certainly, you know, in the abused populations, we develop defense mechanisms and, you know, we yeah. oftentimes we defend, we develop them during our adolescence and then they go into mm-hmm. our adulthood. And, and so we have this facade that is out there that looks together and looks on top of it when inside we're just, we're crumbling and, you know, mm-hmm. we hide it. And I think it's driven, you know, in, at least initially, by the need to look okay, because we don't feel okay. But in that defense mechanism of choosing not to need anybody, really at a psychological level, it's a form of control. Because to the extent Mm -hmm. that I need something from somebody, they have control (laughs) in my life, right? Mm -hmm. And if someone who I need or someone who's close to me has abused me, how can I protect myself? So not to get too long-winded, but I wonder if you can speak to your journey with regard to internalizing that hiding that pain, mm-hmm. wanting to stay in control of not being hurt again, but how that disintegration, if you will, of character from what people see to what's going on inside in, in your journey in that. Well, it's, that's so good. And, and we really get good at projecting those images, don't we? Because we're fighting so hard to, um, to combat what's happening internally. And that was really my own story for so long. And I think that, um, I, my life is really a bit of a juxtaposition um, in the sense that, you know, when God calls me to be vulnerable and to be transparent, and I say dangerously transparent, um, it's what I've understood is that that is a gift for those around me who are hurting. And in my reward then is a gift to me. When I hear someone like you say, wow, I, I, I sat down and I, I actually took the time to process this this book instead of rush through it there's a reward there for me for the price that I paid and I, I think that the the thin when I said that I don't need I, I learned to not need uh, certain friends what I mean by that really and I could have said it better would would be I learned to have boundaries um, in that I I certainly need relationship we all were, were made for that and um, and I have some very precious ones that are gifts to me but um, I've learned to uh, understand what people are capable of giving and not need any more from them than that and so then they're you're not resentful anymore um, in terms of projecting images and coming out of you know, the, the the good Christian home that by all intents and purposes was a great home. But then there was this secret and this awful thing that, you know, had taken place within my uh, beautiful family that, you know, I had a choice at a certain point that was to say, you know, as I let the cat out of the bag, so to speak, what's my motive? 
you know, am I doing this to help others? I wanted to be free and I wanted others to be free. And so, you know, at the point that I wrote my book, it, it wasn't, it certainly wasn't for therapy anymore. I was really long past that point, but there's an element of, um, when you know the truth, then you are, you can be set free. And so I think that I'm, I want to be an encouragement and that requires that I, um, maintain the understanding of the beauty that God's given me as a person, but also understand who I am without him and that, you know, we all have a choice and we all have an answer and there is hope. And so I want to be that vessel of hope and to carry his glory in such a manner that um, I understand what humility is and humility is to understand who you are, but who you're not and who I am is someone who's been given. Uh, made in the image of God and given an absolute um, chance for redemption and restoration. Well, and I think that you speak to a couple of things that are so very profound. And I think that, you know, and Kristen and I, you and I were talking about this not too long ago, but I think that um, the natural tendency in the mind is to organize our world as good or bad, right or wrong. And, you know, that, that comes mm-hmm. in our development. Typically we have a good parent or a bad parent or one that's better and they fall into those roles. And, you know, um, a paramount importance in the work that I do in my clinic setting is um, always inviting people to integrate the good and the bad that there's good and bad in us, there's good and bad in others, and there's good and bad in world in the world. And what I think is right. profound, you know, and not only in your writings, but, you know, and certainly in, in the prayer that you shared with your father, um, was the ability to extend that grace and integrate that, yes, there were some bad things that happened, but there are also some really, really good things. Right. And that, you right. know, the, the, the key that is important um, to be able to navigate that process, and I emphasize process, is forgiveness. Yeah. In that, you know, through forgiveness of other people um, and being able to integrate their good parts and their bad parts, um, we're able to reestablish relationship, but it's it, the gift is ours because then we're also yeah. able to embrace the good parts and the bad parts of self and, and everyone around us. And we no longer have to hide them. You know, so many of us only want to share the good parts of our character and, and don't want to embrace that we all have character defects and we all have not so good parts. And the freedom that we experience in being able to do that, you know, you just so communicate it so very well in your book. Mm-hmm. It was profound. Thank you. And I think we need to, you know, we're in such an unforgiving and angry society and we've just got to start allowing each other to be human and mm-hmm. allow each other the process. You know, we're not all in the same place on the journey, but we share a common thing. And that is that we all need to be seen and heard and valued and loved. Well, and, and, and it extends. I mean, twice last month, I, I think it probably had to do with my, my business travel, but <laughs> twice last month, I paid bills and forgot to sign the checks. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> okay. And so you're, you're like, oh my goodness, who does that? Right. And being able to say, yeah. oh, no, that's okay. Or extending it to the uh-huh. bigger issues. And, and I know that one of the things that is so freeing, not only in my self-perception, but I love doing this in my relationships with other people is when they do something wrong, whether it was intentional or accidental Mm -hmm. is a phrase that I say, welcome to the human race, Mm -hmm. you know, welcome to the human race. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. We can move forward. That's so good, Lisa. Yeah. Yeah. So good. I used to beat myself up over those things and, and I I think I'll go a little easier on myself now. (laughs) I do as well. I do as well. And I think too, um, look, I have a friend of mine, (laughs) she's in pain and she's a friend that no one would want to read these emails because, you know, we're not superstars or anything. So no one could sell them and we're not politicians. But if anyone mm-hmm. found them, you know, we've not held back at all in these emails, basically. <laughs> which is so wow. great to have friends like that. It's actually three friends of mine. We call ourselves the red caped mm-hmm. quattro. And I, I she's going through something difficult dealing with someone really um, challenging her and I'm writing back and we're all writing back. You've got this, you can do this. Don't, you know, you hold the power here, not this person. And she wrote back and she said, I hear you. And you guys sound so brave and you sound so on top of it. And I just don't feel like that. I just feel so tired. And as I'm reading it, I'm responding to her and I'm like, you know what? Everything I wrote, I stand behind and I'm tired too. 
I don't feel like I can always handle everything either. So Mm -hmm. take my sis boom, ba ra ra email and take it for what it is. (laughs) Don't think that that's me, that I've got something handled (laughs) because it's okay to not always have everything handled because that's reality. And that's kind of a new place to sit where you go. I don't have it all together. I don't have it all together. Well, Mm -hmm. and I think, I think being able to, I'm sorry. I think being able to embrace that, that I don't have it all together mm-hmm. comes back to Brenda, what you were saying, you know, that the truth shall set you free. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I know that I I've shared this with you before, Kristen, but one of the things that I teach and I certainly practice in my own life is that to the extent that we know our truth, good, bad, right, wrong, or ugly, but to the extent that we know our truth and we honor that truth and we respect that truth, or in your case, Brenda, I mobilize that truth because others can grow and benefit from it. I believe we thrive. Right. But on the other side, right. I think I think that to the extent that we know our truth and we operate in a manner that's inconsistent with that truth, we have chaos and drama. And that really shined mm. to me as Good. I was reading your book. Yeah. Mm. That, you know, as a young child, you you had this truth and it presented in your dreams and you couldn't really make sense of it. And there were some pieces that weren't fitting and there were some dynamics within the family. And and yet the family looked beautiful on the outside, yet there was this gnawing yeah. pain on the inside. And what really spoke to me, and I have goosebumps as I'm sharing this, is that in your growth process, at least from an outsider's observation, you were able to integrate that truth and no longer live in a manner that was inconsistent. You sought that truth. And then when you had that truth, you didn't beat it into the ground. You used it to free yourself so that you could grow more authentically Yeah, with your family members, which is just beautiful. It's just beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. And, And don't you think it's important? I mean, often what we need from someone is to um, be human and to just sit and and Mm -hmm. hear us or just be with us when we're in our pain. And um, so people that have experienced pain have that kind of compassion and they're able to do that and just hold your hand. Uh, Sometimes we don't need just a bunch of clinical advice, but we just need for someone to just love us through it. Oh, absolutely. And in this podcast today, we think of it from the the victim or the one who's on the receiving end of bad. But oftentimes, uh-huh. you know, I work a, a lot in the field of addiction. I work with someone, for instance, they'll come in and they will have gotten a DUI, right? And they're not someone mm-hmm. who is traditionally irresponsible or, or, an, mm-hmm. or an addict, but even if they were, and to be able to look them in the eyes and say, it's okay. It's okay. Mm-hmm. This is something that you yeah. did. It's not something who you are. And to live in that shame and guilt and remorse only fuels, you know, uh, the shame. There you go. But but to be yeah. able to embrace that, you know, I made a choice that was yeah. not a good choice, and I can make a difference moving forward. I can live in that shame so and hide powerful. from it. Yeah, or I can or I can embrace it and say I am human, and I did make right. a mistake, and I have remorse for it, and I want to grow forward. Mm-hmm. And there's healing, and, and God so offers good. that healing. He offers that healing for yeah. us, all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's our shame that that keeps us trapped in the same cycles when we're doing that self condemnation, you know, and uh, so that is so powerful. Absolutely, well, and, and and I think that Bradshaw, John Bradshaw, he's written a, a number of books, but one of my faves that he's um, written is "Healing the Shame That Binds." And you know, I think that the, the my main takeaway, though there was many takeaways from his, is are many takeaways from his work, is that we get lost in the question of why, you know, in your case, Brenda, why did yeah. dad do that? Or why did dad's family right. do that? And, and we get stuck in that. And I, I tell folks, what, what answer to that question is going to make you feel any better? Follow me, it has occurred. Right. And so, you know, with Bradshaw's mm-hmm. guidance, for years I've used this, we do want to ask why so we can gain an understanding of injury or, or you know, impact right. that things have had. But we really want to move into the how Given the why, yeah. how can there we move go. forward? How can we find healing? Yeah. How can we heal? You know, and it's just it, mm-hmm. when we can change our focus from the why, which causes us to loop and perseverate and get resentful and bitter, harden our own heart, when we can move forward through forgiveness and integrate grace and into the how, everybody benefits. The person who did the offending, the person who's on the receiving end of it, it's the true meaning of God's love, of grace. That's right. And yeah, I really feel like what helped me so much was it, the the how and the why kind of came together whenever I realized, you know, we've got to understand there's a bigger picture here and who's the real enemy. 
you know, the good and evil exists and we've got to understand what are our weapons and how do we combat this and how do we break these cycles? And so, you know, my heart for healing for people is just as much for the victimizer who was once a victim, who needs to break a cycle, who needs to come free uh, and is absolutely got to be filled with shame. I know my father was. I mean, he couldn't hardly confess on his deathbed. Right. It, it took everything else of courage in him to do it. And for that, I say, bravo, you know, you, you did it. You did it. And uh, I think if we can come to that place sooner in our lives where, um, you know, hurting people hurt people. And when we realize that about ourselves, then we can, you know, come it, step into the light is what I keep saying. Just step into the light, the light of God and the love of God, where you can be that broken human and know that what he did for you is enough and he will complete you and fulfill you and completely turn what the enemy meant for harm and use it for good if you love him. So I, that was, uh, you know, go ahead. I, well, I just, I, that rings so true for me because as a young child, my mother would always say, you know, what the enemy intends for destruction, the Lord will use for good. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. as a, as a therapist and as someone who's been in the healing field for, you know, 25, 30 years and with Meyer that long, mm -hmm. um, I've also come to the place where I say, um, beware, um, because the greater your work, the greater yeah. your attack. Um, because, <laughs> you know, so true. <laughs> I practice everything that I teach and yet they, the yeah. trials continue to come. And, you know, just the other day, and I have a very close relationship with my mother and just the other day, and my family has been through a, a significant challenge um, with one of my daughters. And I said, my mom's, how are you doing with that? And I said, you know, mom, I said, it just shows up as it has throughout my entire life, beginning with my own trauma in childhood in right. that everything the enemy has used to try to take me down and take me down roads of destruction by keeping my eyes on the Lord and, and my go-to is thy will be done. You know, I can do all things yeah. through Christ to strengthen me, thy will be done. And I just look, keep mm -hmm. my eyes on him and see it as a challenge of faith. But notoriously, you know, every challenge that I've been through and being willing and open to say, show me, guide me, teach me. Yeah. I, there, not one of those trials has not been used with multitudes of clients that I work with. Meaning I, mm. I not only know this from a clinical perspective, I know it from a personal perspective. And in that it's a gift. And so, you know, do you look back and are you grateful for all the horrible things that have happened to us? No, but are, am I personally right. grateful for the tools and the skills that I've learned and the growth that I've had and how I can share that with others and have that empathic heart forever grateful yeah. because the stuff yeah. I learned, you'd never learn in a book. You'd never learn it. In a That's book. right. That's right. So good. I, uh, I appreciate. And every time I hear that, you know, I just celebrate that is something inside me just leaps with joy because uh, that's our gift. But it, again, it is a choice and we have to fight for it. We do. And it's an interesting life to, or to get to a place where you really are, you figured out what part of your soul's purpose is or your mission, whatever anybody wants to call it. And you really do serve that mission, which is about, yeah. you know, your faith, if that's where you're coming from, or your, um, you know, serving other people, whatever that is, when you really are there, sometimes people do look at you like you're kind of cuckoo. <laughs> Because they yeah. don't understand how what's it's true. No, it's true. Yeah, yeah. And you're just like, oh, you just kind of get used mm -hmm. to having people not really believe that you really mean that or that just are. I mean, I, I've had people, and I, I'm sure some of them haven't meant to be insulting, and some of them probably have, where they've been like, mm -hmm. how do you do what you do? And some of them say, tinged with, with the, the way they say it, I think, is this because you think I'm some kind of dodo head that? that oh. you I can do what I do. Cause that's how they say it. You know, like, mm -hmm. how do you yeah. do this? And I'm right. like, I don't even know no, how to wow. respond well, to that. I think, yeah, I, think, <laughs> I think that comes, I, I think that comes back to what Brenda was saying earlier in that 
I believe that the healthier our boundaries, <laughs> the, le- the less time we spend yeah. angry because yeah. we choose not to take it personally. Yeah, we exactly. see it as a reflection. Yeah, of their character. Exactly. But if we're tired and we do take it personally, uh, it's okay too. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, wow. I, say, I, I say, I say, choosing. I say that choosing to take to not take things personally is like choosing to use a Phillips head screwdriver. It's a coping mechanism. <laughs> oh we my pick, goodness, that's good. We, we pick yeah. it up and we say, I'm going to choose not to take this personally. <laughs> yeah. And not in an effort not to feel. We still yeah. need to take those oh, feelings absolutely. into relationship. Yeah. But it's a choice. Yeah. It's certainly a it choice. Is. And that's part of you that's part of our, you know, our toolbox. You know, what are the tools that we're using to get through each day with wisdom, with discernment <laughs> and uh, with purpose. So that's such a good analogy. And I think too, to take that uh, thought one step further, it's not just our circles, but um you know, even this kind of me too culture that is almost shaping the new narrative in our society. And we, and I think that it's very good that, that we've opened up the conversation where we've brought this to the table, but it's um, not going to be good if we just stay in a place where we're, you know, throwing our fists in the air, we're angry, we all remain victims. Right. And we just want to, you know, expose the monster instead of, being brave enough to um, approach this from a, a, a higher perspective, a bigger perspective and saying, how do we heal our world? How do we heal this generation mm-hmm. and the generations that came before us? You know, it's in our bloodlines. And so I think this is a very serious issue that we have to approach it sometimes with humor. And uh, we have to understand mm-hmm. That, you know, for me personally, I I love the, there's a scripture that says that he will take the weak and the foolish and abase things of this world to confound the wise. And, you know, I have to remind myself of that whenever I do silly things and I think, oh, you know, I wish I was the scholastic intellect and, you know, I think I'm a smart person, but, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not that. Yeah, I have a, a, a trail of broken uh, dreams and failures behind me. And, and yet, look at God, look at what he does, and he makes all things new again. And so I think we just have to remind ourselves that it's a, you know, it's a humble journey, uh, you know, when we are carriers of his truth in that light. Brenda, I wonder, um, you know, so one of the scriptures, or my paraphrasing of the scripture, I wonder if you can speak to it, where we are taught that we know the love of the Lord who has no mm-hmm. flesh through those around us who do, and the confusing component of when the hurts um, come from our Father here on earth and how that confounds or complicates our relationship with our Father in heaven. It absolutely does. And and this is probably one of my biggest burdens, you know, for parents and for those who are um, influencers. And I think that, uh, you know, ultimately we can circle back to what we were talking about earlier you know, the mysteries of God, I mean, God is so complex and yet he's so simple. He's, he's, to me, this big kind of, he's the Alpha and Omega, this juxtaposed figure. And we, we're we never going to really truly understand him. But as we get to know him, we begin to understand the way he works. And he can use flawed people and broken things. We see it all the time in, in our society. We, I mean, uh, you know, on every level. And so I think that what happens as we uh, navigate through these landmines, so to speak, in relationships, and, and we have to learn how to heal our wounds that come from them, is as we get closer to him and allow him to his truth to heal us, then um, we are able to understand this this concept of humanity i love the i don't know if you read the um the foreword in my book written by dr mark sharona who has a a double doctorate one in psychology and he he wrote about how we're becoming fully human yes and we're on this journey and i thought wow what a beautiful thing to say i've never heard that before and you know to to think about what was what was the idea and the concept of man from creation, you know, that's what we're returning to. That's what we're aspiring to get back to, you know, where Adam and Eve in the garden, what they were created to be and how they were designed to walk in, in this authority and dominion. And I think that because of people feel powerless and they're filled with fear, you know, that's our broken system. And so we, 
we it's about changing our mindsets and and being transformed from the inside out and in so doing we become the humans that we were supposed to be little by little you know it's a process you know but I don't know if I even answered your question but <laughs> well, and I, would, I would say I would say not only do I think it's a process but I believe it's a practice um, because I believe oh, yeah. yeah I believe secondary to the fall and the fact that we are broken that you know untamed we go back to our greatest dysfunction and you know i think yeah. that dis, you know we all over scripture we, we read about disciplining the mind and how i teach that in my practice is that what you think you become your thoughts will create yeah. a reality and you know really discipline that our mind is a beautiful mind but it can go to very mm. broken places where we are constantly yeah. dissecting not only ourselves but those around us but when we choose to look mm. at this is something that was given to me years ago and it was definitely given to me by the lord i walk in green lake back when i lived in seattle and it was, I was having a, a very um, challenging situation in my life with a very good friend who really did me wrong. And um, mm -hmm. the message was very clear. And if you guys were here or you'd see me hold my hands up to show you um, visually what it looks like. But he said, Lisa, I challenge you to look for something to love and to leave something lovable mm -hmm. in every path that you cross. And the cross I see is Jesus Christ, the cross. So to look for something yeah. to love and to leave something lovable in every path that you crossed. You see, we are not called to judge, but we're called to love. And that was spoken to me many, many moons ago. But I, again, I get goosebumps as I share it because it has been oh, so good. profound. Yeah. And finding grace. And when people do wrong, and boy, you know, in the field of psychology, I deal with a lot of people who do really bad things. I'm going to visit mm -hmm. a young man in jail and it's it's that I can I can yeah. love you because I don't need to decide what you've done or to judge what you've done right. mm -hmm. but I can help provide a space for your healing you know provide that right. grace you know for your healing it's huge but you know in that process too Brenda when you spoke to powerlessness I think that it's so very important because when we've been on the receiving end and I think all three of us here know that we are absolutely powerless over some mm -hmm. of the horrific things that have happened to us in our journey and so, you know, I always take my hands again that, you know, when we come to these challenges in life, we need to be able to clearly delineate where we are powerless and where we have influence. But the key in that is that when we are powerless, we don't then deny those feelings. I tell anybody who comes in my office, if I ever teach you not to feel, you should fire me. But we have to be able to embrace that we are powerless. And in that gap in between, yeah. the gap in between yeah. powerlessness and where we have influence, those are the feelings that we take into relationship or into the light, as you say, to find healing, to have that grace, to have that forgiveness, to have that grieving, if you will, of what has happened. That's so good. And you know, as we're, as we become, as we learn to become motivated by love, I mean, love is our power. If, and it, you know, we, we've got it all wrong in our, in our culture. We think that power means money and, and, uh, you know, oh, platform yeah. and, all this other stuff that we're, we're hitting, we're, we're reaching for the wrong tools and, and often hurting others in the wake of our, our journey. Our but I think that our, our pursuit yeah. for power, you know, and uh, it, it, when, when love becomes the motivator, there is no greater power than love. So, I mean, think, think on that one. Well, and I think that is hugely profound that if we can come from the place of love, looking for something to love yeah. and leaving something lovable. But at the same time, yeah. I think that our pursuit for love or our need for love yeah. is often the very yeah. thing that gets us denying our truth and then having the follow up of chaos and drama. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, so in true. that journey, yeah, that we want to be, we want to bring love, but we also have to be aware of our own need for love can cause us to trip and to get stuck. And to see right. you know, human which, validation. Yeah. Yes. Which is exactly what I was going back to earlier um, when I said I learned not to need um, the human form because my cup got filled when I understood. And that's why having a relationship with God is so important because he is the source of love. And when that, that inner cup, that void gets filled up and your narrative begins to change, you have something to give and you're so much less needy than you once were. And you're not as you're not codependent anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I think so about that me, there's no other way to break that cycle. Absolutely. And I think about too, when I've heard people say, I really operate from the center of my, of my being. 
and you know that can be interpreted in so many ways but how i take that is okay sure. i believe in something greater than myself i yeah i practice self care i go to counseling if needed i do things in service of others sure i falter but then i you know write myself yeah but i'm not walking around as this wound that is grasping yep grasping grasping right. grasping and it's so, I mean, and it takes work. I, you know, I, I, when I, I said something about this the other day to someone who said, well, maybe I'll go to counseling, you know, um, but I'm just going to tough it out. And I could hear the stigma, you know, in their, yeah. in their, in yeah. their voice. And I, I don't uh -huh. judge about that stuff anymore because <laughs> I know it's there. This is why I do what I do because I'm trying mm -hmm. to get people to not think that you're weak for going to counseling. Right. It's like, the toughest people, the pull yourself mm -hmm. up by your bootstraps people, the mm -hmm. marathon of life people are the ones that will go do that yep. work. It's, yep. They aren't yep. necessarily the ones that won't do it. And that's where that whole opposition is. It's like once you cross that bridge and you go, ah, yes, I do live from this center. So I'm not constantly yeah. in lack mode. And right. You, I see how strong I am that I will go get help. Well, I, I think that too, though, in that process, Kristen, I think that people are afraid to get help because oh, I think absolutely. that, you know, in our journeys that some of us have been hurt so very badly that we self-preserve, we become our own protector, oh, yeah. our own guardian. Oh, yeah. we're, we, we're not going to let anybody in because that way we're not going to get hurt. And, and unfortunately that interferes with one, not only, bringing into the light our brokenness and not only seeking therapy, but unfortunately it interferes with our relationship with the Lord because we're so yeah. self-preserving and we come up with a schema of operating that's going to keep us safe that it prevents our growth. So, you know, I always say that fear is the number one prohibitor of growth, but when we've been on the receiving end of trauma, we're afraid. We're afraid yeah, of therapy. Absolutely. We're yeah. afraid of a vulnerability because that could mean we could be injured further. That's so good. You both said that so well. <laughs> well and it is such work. It, it takes courage. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've encouraged people is that, you know, listen, what you're fighting for is you. And uh, yes. you, you know, be, be courageous and, and do this for you. Do, do it for yourself. Um, because we, it, it's really, a, it's trickery. It's deception to think that it's not worth it. Uh, in the, it's hard work and it, it's not always comfortable. But, you know, the truth sometimes hurts, but then that's followed by freedom. And wow, you know, there's nothing can replace. You can't put a price on that. Oh, absolutely not. Well, I, I tell people, Brenda, that if you're going, so for many people who come in with trauma, I, I'm, I'm pretty honest. And I flat out say, you know, that this isn't um, an easy process. And in fact, um, particularly when the trauma is at the hands of our parents, I say to them that if you're able to do this work, I promise you, it will be the hardest thing you've ever done because it's going to go yeah. di dynamically against every protective dynamic that you've created for your operating system. Yeah. It will not it be does. void of pain. Yeah, it will not. Yeah. I say, I say the pathway yeah. to wisdom, the pathway to wisdom is yeah. not void of pain, but what we experience yeah. on the other side is a freedom beyond all knowing. It's just a freedom. Mm. Yeah. And as you're saying that, Lisa, I, I think about those who have siblings, you know, because we come from family systems. And when one person is a catalyst, you know, and they're the, the monkey wrench that's kind of saying eh, something's wrong here, it can cause this ripple effect that is not comfortable. And it can take years sometimes for that to process. But the beauty of knowing that God is the one that you've put, you've allowed him to be in control and, and, and you've stepped back from that place of control that you once tried to be, is to, to know and have the peace that they will journey to with you and, and that they'll get there. And I've watched, you know, members of my own family who have come free, are coming free. And to me, uh, that's another part of the reward, you know, for having the courage to do the hard work and to say you can do it too. Absolutely. I want to make sure, Brenda, that our listeners know about your podcast. 
Okay. So can you, because I, I didn't talk about that when I was introducing you. So can you tell them what the name of it is and how often you do it and where they can find it? Yeah, actually the podcast is brand new. I'm in the, the, I've got all my radio interviews on my podcast right now, which you can find on at my website, brendacrouch.com. And we are scripting to begin to shoot video podcasts where I feel like, you know, you ladies are a rare breed. Not everybody understands the intention behind my book, Fight Forward. And so I want to do this Fight Forward podcast where I delve into this subject more and I'm able to kind of explain the real message because I don't want people to limit this as that I'm just trying to just tell my story. I'm just with a victim of abuse. And there's just so much more to it. And I feel like there are some answers and tools that are given in here from a very practical and uh, faith-based viewpoint that will help people and it'll encourage people. And and I encourage them to find counselors who are experienced in this area. So I do point them to people like you, but that is, that's what the the new podcast will be. It's a video podcast. We're so excited about it. Mm -hmm. And I've got other interviews on my podcast right now, but you can find that at brendacrouch.com. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. And, um, oh, it's, it's been a pleasure. And oh, I feel absolutely. like I just made two new friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, the, the, only, the only thing we need to do is do this in person someday. I would yes. Love and to have Maureen. Together and chat. Yeah. yeah. Have Maureen come. We've been yeah. doing, uh, Lisa oh. and I have been yeah. doing filmed things too. And that's been a big, interesting, interesting endeavor, which wow. you know I'm saying, but because I hear more about that. <laughs> yeah. Of only one reason, because it reaches another audience. Never yes, good for you. audio, but oh. reaching that other audience that, that film brings in. So yeah, maybe we, so awesome. we all will sit down. We've got Maureen, you know, running around being uh, our consultant and working for yeah. us, and pushing what we do out to places like Truly and Sony and right, Chicken right. Soup for the Soul. Yeah. And, you know, and yeah, it's awesome. She's amazing. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> like, I don't know how I got so lucky that she's a part of my life. I'm sure you feel the same way. But oh, have likewise. Yes. Yeah contact so yeah we need to we will figure that yeah. will all happen as it's supposed to because i i feel like you all uh, that you know the three of us will be sitting down having a conversation and we will forget the cameras there <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah. we got to do it It'd be, yeah yeah be awesome awesome well thank you so much for coming on the meyer clinics podcast brenda thank you absolutely Been great dr lisa day of course my cohort thank you for joining me on this as well I love it always. <laughs> and listeners, thank you for tuning in to another episode. Sometimes I'm passive aggressive, but never without good intentions. I heat up and act on my emotions. Thanks so much for listening to Mental Health News Radio. Our podcast can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, and hundreds of other podcast apps. Or you can visit our website at mentalhealthnewsradio.com. If you have a question or would like to be a guest, become a podcaster on our network, or join the amazing organizations that help keep us on the air, please email us at info at mhnrnetwork.com. Get ready for that special goodbye from our resident therapy dog, Miles, and a special thanks to Emily Sohn for letting us use her incredible song, Cordial, for our podcast music. Listen to the full song on SoundCloud at emily.sonne. Don't be surprised when I don't hate on you. After all we promised, we'd be cordial.